Okay, so we are now recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And hello, everybody. Welcome right. to uh, March 3rd meeting of the uh, Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, before we get going, the uh, meeting uh, minute taking responsibility. Um, thanks to Martha for the minutes um, from last week. And that brings us to Jack. You, um, yeah, great. Okay, so you're uh, uh, on board with that. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, and just a heads up, that means uh, Janet's next. Great. Okay. Um, and do we have a full house? I think so. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, great. And uh, welcome, Adrian, from uh, GZA, um, who's um, going to be on the agenda shortly. Um, and um, we have two minutes to approve, uh, one now almost historic, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get through both of those. But I do wonder, uh, Stephanie, is it um, best at this point to um, move straight to Adrian? Um, how would you? It, it would be, I mean, if we could hold it off till after her presentation, I think just in consideration of her time. Yeah, I, I think that would um, make sense um, for uh, for uh, her, certainly, and for all of us. A um, oh, good Chris is joining us as well. Uh, and let me just see uh, who's with us from the outside uh, public. Okay, great. Uh, we have a couple of participants. Okay, so um, uh, again, just to outline what we're going to be working on today, we have um, uh, a presentation or or disc and discussion with um, Adrian again from GZA. Uh, this being more uh, um, maybe a, a brief update on the public uh, uh, participation process, but more so focusing on the um, uh, mapping, uh, solar assessment mapping that um, is is. Uh, uh, getting to an endpoint uh, to share that with us. Um, and um, then we will do some of our normal things, approve the minutes and so forth, or review them. Uh, and then uh, we do have, you know, the bulk of the time will be with Chris, um, again, doing a second reading of the uh, submittal requirements uh, portion of the bylaw that we looked at last time, and a first reading, as we'll call it, uh, and thank you so much again, Chris, for, for um, new draft uh, language on the design standards um, section of the of the bylaw. So we'll get into that. And then um, kind of a long standing item um, that we'll uh, really get today, uh, get to today is um, future topics. And, and Janet's going to lead us through some ideas she has there. Uh, and shared with us, uh, but also open that up to uh, to all of us as well, um, and uh, that's and, and round it out obviously with um, the next uh, agenda for next meeting and uh, public comment. Um, so if that sounds good with everybody, uh, we'll proceed and and um, go out of order from the agenda, and invite um, uh, Adrian uh, to. Um, give us her um, presentation and discussion on the um, uh, on the um, solar assessment update and community outreach. Thank you, Adrian. Great, thanks, Duane. Um, give me just a moment, I will share my screen. All right, nice to be back with you all. Um, so this is, as Dwayne said, an update on the outcome of the solar assessment, the map based process, um, and then an update on the upcoming um, public outreach. So our assessment purpose, um, what we were asked to do is to understand kind of where in Amherst solar could be sited and what that total um, solar capacity could be. And that's across all land uses um, and all types of solar. So you know, our ground mount, residential, and, and large scale, um, rooftop, canopy, so kind of all solar uses, all, all land areas. Um, and so we took kind of a multi-phased approach 
where first we filtered down the areas in Amherst where solar could be sited. Um, and so to do that, we divided the town up into 30 foot by 30 foot grids so that we could get a lot of resolution um, about the town. And we could also be making those decisions um, based only on kind of what is happening in that very limited geographic area versus making an assumption about an entire tax parcel um, from, you know, if it contains wetlands, but maybe not the whole parcel. So this allowed us to really get a lot more detail. Um, and so we looked at where it could be sited. That filtered out a lot of Amherst. From there, we looked at the feasibility of potential solar development. And so, um, you know, there's kind of a lot of ways to interpret feasibility, but we really thought about it as um, the possibility to do something easily or conveniently. So a high feasibility ranking might be um, easier to develop and a low feasibility ranking might be harder to develop. Um, but it's not necessarily saying it definitely would go here and it definitely couldn't go there. It's kind of just a relative understanding of the challenge involved um, in preparing and implementing a site, uh, a solar development. And then we also characterize kind of, again, based on those areas that were left after we excluded parts of town, what land use is there today? <laughs> Um, so as I said, we, we overlaid the town with this 30 foot by 30 foot grid. Um, from there, we excluded any grid squares that were owned by the University of Massachusetts, Amherst College or Hampshire College. Um, these organizations have their own renewable goals and are working towards those. So they kind of won't be influenced by the town's goals and the, the town's incentives. Um, we also excluded grid squares where solar development's prohibited. Um, so that is wetlands, um, the Wetland Protection Act and the town wetland protection bylaw um, have pretty robust um, prohibitions on solar development in wetlands. Um, and we also excluded um, any grid squares on properties that have a deed restriction against development. So that's a, a deed restriction in perpetuity. So that's conservation land, state forest, um, and some other um, site. And then the logistically infeasible, that's primarily rights of way. So both utility rights of way, railroads, um, and roadways. And then we ranked the remaining grid squares um, on, on a series of characteristics and then looked again at that um, existing land use. So, um, right, this is kind of what, why we went with the, the overlay with the grid, you know, maybe this, a whole property here would have been excluded because there's some wetlands. But in our analysis, we're able to exclude only the wetlands and still consider, you know, potential residential development elsewhere on the property. So that's really a, a benefit of this um, process. It's also, gives the um, assessment outcome a little bit more longevity um, because parcel boundaries can change. And then, um, but, you know, these grids aren't really um, going to change that same, that same way. So um, as I said, we prohibited wetlands and streams and then those deed restricted areas. Um, they, the deed restricted areas may be considered um, Article 97 lands, but they weren't always. So, um, that's what we looked at if they had a development restriction in perpetuity, they were prohibited from, from our list. Um, and then those rights of way. Um, all in all, we ended up with 6,632 acres of potentially developable area. So areas that were not categorically excluded. And that comes out to approximately one third of Amherst. There's about um, a little less than 18,000 acres in Amherst. So we come out right around one third of the town could support solar legally. <laughs> um, so then the scoring. So we looked at four characteristics. Um, and so we applied these. We looked at the slope, so how steep the land is, the aspect, what, what kind of cardinal direction does it face, the capacity of the nearest three phase line. Um, so if there's existing grid infrastructure to accept the electricity and then the distance to that nearest three phase line. Um, 
every grid square was assigned a ranking from zero, which was the lowest, to 10, the highest, for each of those four categories independently. And then a final score was calculated, again, for every grid square um, that wasn't excluded. And that score integrated the four characteristics um, and came out with a final score from zero, again, low, to 10 high. Um, and our calculation, you know, it didn't just take the average, it used um, a least square approach. So it really biased the final score um, to low if there were a low score involved. So, you know, a site that had um, maybe three good scores and one really low one, um, it would look lower than if you had just averaged those four scores. Um, and we did that because we knew we we're coming out with, at the end of the day, some capacity estimate. Um, and so we wanted to not really um, come up with this real pie in the sky number of like, oh yes, it could be pretty feasible, high feasibility score on, on some huge acreage um, if there were really more on the ground challenges. So we kind of wanted to, to tamp down um, maybe some of that optimism so that we could come up with, provide um, more plausible numbers. And I know the ECAC will be looking at some, you know, recommendations and goals. And so we, we wanted to give them um, and you all a, a more tempered uh, approach. So, so we kind of made some choices consistently to be somewhat conservative in the areas that we calculated. Um, and then the last step was to classify the remaining areas as built or unbuilt environment. And so here, this uses the um, 26, 2016 Massachusetts land use layer. Um, the blacked out areas are the areas that are excluded. And um, during the ECAC meeting, there was a comment that it, this doesn't really look like two thirds excluded. So I'm going to try to zoom in. Um, that's about as far as PowerPoint will let me go. But, you know, there's the large areas down here, Lawrence Swamp is excluded. Um, Holyoke, you know, state, state forest down here on the Holyoke Range is excluded. Um, you know, UMass. Um, but there's also, you know, every road surface is excluded. And so there's a lot of these narrow strips of excluded areas that that kind of aggregates up to, you know, about, about two thirds of the area being excluded. Um, it's kind of similar, if you look, orange is residential. We know there's quite a bit of residential development in Amherst, but um, because it's small areas at this scale, it, it is sort of visually underrepresented, but in the calculations, it's, it, arithmetically represented correctly. Um, so what won't surprise you all is a lot of town is considered um, undeveloped as forest, as open space, as agriculture. Um, and so in our report, we'll be breaking down those um, into more detail and more table format about um, each ranking and each land use area. But really this is the, the outcome um, in terms of ex excluded areas. Um, and current land use conditions. Uh, this map will be hosted by the town. Um, and so it'll be similar if you all, I'm sure many of you have used the um, zoning maps on the, the town GIS site. You can turn layers on and off. You can zoom in, you can click on a property and see a little bit about that property. Um, this map will be similar to be able to zoom in and see a ranking. Um, you know, you'll there'll be the parcel layers on there. Um, and then there'll be some other reference layers. So if you want to kind of understand more about what's going on, we'll have the priority habitat there um, and um, bio core habitat um, and some other kind of reference layers so that individuals who might want to maybe, you know, check out their property or scroll around their neighborhood um, can understand what's going on. Uh, as well as developers who are initially screening a site um, can get that information. So we, we uh, have designed a tool that kind of can be used by a diverse user group to get um, kind of different types of information that may be pertinent to them. Um, I am gonna just stop share, I'm gonna exit my PowerPoint.
um, because I did get a question during the ECAC meeting um, about the priority habitat um, areas and the biomap areas um, that the, sorry, the menu is kind of blocking one of my tabs here. Um, but there are some areas that are eligible or ineligible um, based on the presence of priority habitat and or bio core habitat, um, which bio core habitat includes several types of habitat, aquatic, forested. Um, it's kind of like a little bit of a catch all um, how I'm using bio core, but, but they're designated by, um, you know, the state division of fish and wildlife. Um, and so that, that was brought up during our ECAC meeting. So I did want to address it. Um, lands that are ineligible for the SMART program incentives due to the presence of that habitat, um, that is limited to projects that are on a category two or three land use. Um, and so that's not, so that's not everywhere. Um, there's category one land use, which covers lands that are currently in agricultural use um, or are considered important agricultural farmland, which the regulations define as prime, um, prime soils, farmland soils, um, unique farmland soils, and then um, non-agricultural lands, which are already developed areas. So um, the category two lands um, is a little bit more limited in that it's lands that are not category one and have not previously been developed. So we did um, take that eligibility criteria into account, but we didn't um, just geographically exclude anywhere that had the priority habitat um, because that starts to really get down to a parcel by parcel decision about how much area on this parcel is considered this category. Um, and so that comes down to a much more project specific decision. And we were looking at um, an aggregated area across town. Um, so our final map product and our report will both have um, the ability to overlay those layers um, because they are important and they are part of the decision making process, but they are not um, a kind of as blanket a statement as like a wetland exclusion. That's pretty blanket that that solar panels can't go in wetlands. Um, but solar panels, you know, can go in properties containing priority habitat in many, but not all cases. So just to try to capture um, where it's fairly straightforward and where it's much more complex, um, we included the, the straightforward things in this assessment and then the fairly complex will be optional add-ons by the user using the map. Um, and it will be shown in our report and kind of discussed um, what that means. Uh, mm -hmm. And then a final note, just before I open up for any questions, you know, is that we, this is a map from um, the Department of Energy Resources. And so these kind of green and pink and gray areas, they're the areas that that could be considered ineligible if they're category two or three lands. And um, they do largely line up with the areas we excluded. So, you know, this is Lawrence Swamp and this is, you know, the state forest land. So um, it certainly is a consideration and it was a really great question um, by the ECAC member. So we did appreciate that giving us this opportunity to clarify, um, but, a lot of the areas do overlap because, which makes sense, where are the rare species? Primarily in the conserved lands and the wetlands. Um, and so it'll be kind of user optional to add that information to their consideration. Um, with that, I'm gonna go back to the slides and then I'm going to pause a moment for questions. Um, I apologize, I have one screen, so you will have to, Watch me watch you. Great. Um, thanks, Adrian. Um, Janet, I see your hand up. Um, on the, uh, Adrian, I'm sorry. I, I was I, I got a little bit lost in the um, 
categories under the SMART program. Um, so the SMART program is excluding the category one lands and two or the two and three, which ones were excluded? Two and three are excluded. And so category one lands were which lands and they can, they, they can be have solar on it with some limitations? Yeah, the category one lands um, in the regulations have, there's agricultural category ones and non-agricultural category ones. Um, you know, so a, a, certainly if you had a project, you would wanna go through kind of everything very closely, but generally the agricultural lands are lands that are currently in agriculture, have recently been in agriculture in the last five years, or are underlain by um, um, farmland soils. Um, so that's you know your prime farmland, farmland of unique importance, statewide importance. Um, so those are your agricultural ones, and then there's kind of um, some kind of sub explanations of you know you can put on this size or 200 percent of the agricultural energy need. Um, so so those are in your agriculture category one. Your non-agricultural so, category one is kind of anywhere that's developed. Okay, so for the agricultural category ones, can you put solar on the soils, the farm soils? Yep, there's um, explanations and, and performance okay. standards for development in the SMART program regulation. Okay. And so the ineligibility of a property due to the presence or extent of the presence of priority habitat or bio core habitat, those that ineligibility applies to your category two and three properties. Um, and so again, that, that's why we, we didn't kind of apply that as a blanket across the, the, the town um, because there's a fair amount of decision-making and understanding is a given area category one, two, or three because um, some of it has to do with the history of the site, the use of the site. Um, and so that is just kind of beyond the scope of this project, especially given that parcels can change um, and that, you know, priority habitat and that biocore habitat, um, those maps are updated by um, their parent agency, you know, somewhat regularly. So we're planning on including those, as I said, as reference layers, but not as like an exclusionary criteria. So, okay, so at no point are you going to say you can't build on the category two and threes? Right. We don't identify each land as category one, two, or three um, because that's a much more, that's not, it's not an exclusively geographic decision. So that would be like a property by property decision being made. Okay, thank you. Th thank you. Um, Chris. Thank you. So Adrian, when you say these are excluded from the SMART program, that means they're excluded from a certain type of tax incentive or financial benefit that would allow these large scale things to be built. Um, it doesn't mean that they're prohibited. It just means that they wouldn't benefit from this SMART program. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay, correct. thank you. Yeah, good distinction. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, great. Then I... Oh. Is there another... Is, are you again, Mar uh, Janet? Yeah, actually, I just, I really honed it on that smart program because I was very just kind of confused. I I was surprised that you didn't look at the college and university owned lands, um, partly because the college's own land that isn't on their campuses, but also because those um, institutions seem to have the most um, rooftops and parking lots and buildings. Um, and they also have the most, like a lot of them I'm thinking about UMass and a little bit um, maybe Hampshire College, they have a lot of, they have a fair amount of open fields that aren't being farmed. And so um, I know, you know, everybody has a plan, but it, I don't know that every, the plan is to use, to cover every um, parking lot or the rooftops. And so, um, and it seems to me like a strategy for the town could be saying to UMass, well, you know, most of your 
you know, or actually Amherst College, like you're looking at geothermal and you're buying your solar power from up in Maine, a, a facility in Maine, you know, if you cut, you know, but have you considered doing the rooftops or whatever? So I, I just think I would, I just expected those lands to be part of it um, to the assessment. I've never heard that they would be excluded since they have a lot of land. I mean, you know, Amherst College has land on Southeast Street that isn't part of their campus technically. Yep, they, you know, they do own a lot of land. The decision to exclude them was because they have their own targets and they are pursuing those. And so today they have maybe a lot of open space they're not using, but they may have plans that we're not privy to, to use that. And so the town didn't want to, um, again, when thinking about how much solar is Amherst's fair share to generate and where could it go? They didn't want to rely on lands that the university or the college may be earmarking for um, their own use and their own development down the road. So they wanted to limit it to more properties that, um, you know, while they can't make any residential, pro you know, owner install solar, that they could more directly um, incentivize or encourage um, compared to the universities. So, so someone from the town said, exclude that. And even if they have excess capacity on their plans, we're not gonna see that. So who was hey, that? Hey, they, you, just <laughs> speaking for UMass, um, we could build out all the solar we wanted to and we would, we would be far uh, less than, than what the energy that we need. Uh, I presume that's the same with the other uh, the two colleges as well. Okay. Uh, but, uh, Chris, did you have another uh, question? I just wanted to elaborate. On, I just wanted to elaborate on that, um, that we don't have control over the university or the uh, colleges to make them do anything. So that's one of the reasons why we excluded their lens. Thank you. Great. Um, Martha, and then we'll continue. Yeah. Thank you for your overview. Um, can you tell us when the, the full report will be available to us? Will there be another presentation with the results? The full report is um, scheduled to be done by the end of April for your use in um, you know, decision-making on your, your final iteration of the bylaw throughout May. Um, and so that final report will include the assessment information and also the community outreach information. Uh-huh. Okay, and so anything between now and the end of April, or um, not on the assessment? You know, we're we're okay. continuing to do some some calculations in terms of, like I said, kind of really being able to provide all the information to you all. But this is the outcome of the assessment. So now we're just kind of parsing out different um, results from this outcome. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jenna, one last, one last, and then we'll. Sure. Continue. So I, I actually, um, I, I had, when we talked about this in the fall, I, I remember being told like there was going to be this, you know, grid thirty by thirty thing, and then there was going to be a second round of looking at parcels, and, um, and then you know, so it's not just saying you know if I happen to own like ten acres of land, you know, ten, you know it's like, you know, that parcel might get excluded for some reason. And so I had the impression there was going to be sort of a second call after the um, the grid thing where we could look parcel and parcel and say, oh, this is excluded for this reason or whatever, or there's wetlands in this, and then it'll be in this little funny corner and it doesn't really work. Are, and, and I also had the impression that we were able to show the first thing to in to the community. And so I'm just wondering, like, are we going to get that second comb through and then um, what can the community actually see? Because I know people are going to be immediately in a meeting wanting to see what happens in their neighborhood and that'd be good to show them. Um, Stephanie, did you have a comment on that first? I do actually. Um, so when we were, we were discussing the the technical analysis and we were saying that we were looking at two options of how to create the map and one was by parcel and one was by the grid and that we decided on the grid. We never said that we would provide a parcel map as well. We were explaining that there were two different approaches and we were explaining why we ended up going with the grid versus the parcel. So um, I think it might've been a, 
um, misinterpretation of what was stated. Um, will there be a parcel overlay though at some yeah. point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That final that final map that's hosted by the town that will have the parcel overlay. So you could zoom okay. into your own parcel and say, oh, the back corner is excluded, but the front faces south. It's pretty flat. That might be great. Um, or maybe you know my parcel slopes to the north. It's all kind of mediocre for solar. Um, so that's where yeah, that's where kind of a personal parcel investigation could go on. I just wanted to jump in and say that the that's why the reason why we went with the grid was because it actually gives you more information on your parcel versus like a blanket categorization of what your parcel looks like, if that makes sense. Great, let's um, carry on then. Okay, um, I'm gonna minimize your faces so you don't have to, again, watch me watch you, um, but we'll open it back up at the end. Um, so our public participation plan, you've seen this infographic before, um, you know, this is this is a, a supported way to kind of try to not just inform your community, but also get input back from the community involve them. Um, and so this is underway, um, you will start to be seeing information about this project kind of throughout town, um, it's really starting to ramp up now. Um, so under this inform category, right, our website is live. Um, we're going to be starting to advertise it soon. Um, we're working closely with the town director of communication, um, who um, she and Stephanie are working closely in developing a press release um, that'll be going out on social media, traditional print media, through email. Um, we will be mailing postcards directly to residences with information about this project um, and a QR code so they can, you know, walking back from the from the mailbox, they can scan it and get more information. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the town social media will be updated. Um, flyers are going to be posted in public locations. Um, they're also going to go out to the town network, which is um, the town employees and then employees. Um, you know, like Stephanie and all her counterparts throughout town who support boards and committees and um, commissions will share that information with their boards um, and committees and commissions. And then flyers will also be posted um, at, you know, apartment complexes if they have an office or a laundry room, um, kind of those communal spaces. Um, and then that inform kind of a, a category sums up with a virtual presentation. And so we'll be giving a presentation March 13th at 7 p.m. online. Um, it'll be on the community calendar. Um, everyone can can call in and listen. Um, and it'll be about the project, um, about the assessment piece. And then also what the real focus is, is how people can get involved. Um, during that presentation, there will be some polling um, asked of participants um, to get some, you know, kind of initial ideas and, and try to get a little bit of a commitment of people to come to the consult phase and the involved phase. So in consultation with the town, you know, we are going to be on Engage Amherst. We, we talked about this as we were developing the survey, you know, that, that we would have questions on Engage Amherst. And so that should be up um, in the next couple of days. And we'll have the opportunity for people to weigh in, comment with each other, um, we can comment. Um, that information will be captured and included in the report. Um, pretty much any time we are getting information back from the community, so even during that public the virtual meeting, the polls, that data will be downloaded and included in the report. Um, and then we have the survey available. It's online now. Um, it'll start to be, you know, as I said, really advertised um, in the next couple of days. It's going to run through this month. Um, and it is available in four languages. So it's available in English, Spanish, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese. Um, and it's it's available now. Uh, again, all those the results of that, all that data will be you know compiled and included in the report um, for review. And then we have two interactive workshops planned. Um, they're both in the Jones Library Woodbury room. Um, they're Saturday, March 18th, and Thursday. March 23rd, um, and they are both two hours long. Um, the Saturday one's midday, the Thursday one's in the evening. Um, and they are meant to be, uh, they're actually, they're gonna be both the same. So people only have to come to one to get their opinion heard. Um, and they're gonna have a series of 
interactive activities. And so we've designed this to be, you know, really safe place for people to voice their opinion, even if they're, you know, maybe a little bit nervous to, um, it's going to be, yeah, unique kind of separate tables with different ways for them to vote on things. Um, we are going to have options and opportunities available for people with, you know, limited literacy um, or lit limited English to be able to participate. There'll be some interpretation available. Um, and there'll be ways for them to interact, you know, for people to interact with each other kind of through, um, you know, written or, or voting. And then also, you know, we'll be there to answer questions. There'll be kind of an open-ended comment box. Um, and there will be refreshment served um, and there will be some children's activities. So our goal is to really make it easy for people to come and participate. Um, and they can stay for two hours, do every single activity, um, leave comments, talk to us, ask questions, um, or they could come for five minutes while they're, you know, bring it, dropping their kids off at the library, run in, uh, maybe do an activity or two and go on their way. So we've tried to design this so that people can be can participate to the extent they're comfortable with um, and still still have their opinion heard. Um, again, all that information will be kind of tallied up and included in the report. Um, so our public outreach resources are live, the QR code and the link, they go to the same place. At the top of the page, the page is in English, but at the top of the page, you can pick to go to the Spanish, simplified Chinese or traditional Chinese page at the bottom, you can enter your email address and then you'll get added to an email list so that, you know, we'll send out a reminder, hey, the meeting's tomorrow, you know, don't forget to log in, hey, the meeting's tonight, it's in a half an hour. Um, so for people who are who are uniquely interested, they can get added to that list. Um, and then, as I said, the um, director of communications um, and through other town employees, we'll also be disseminating that same information. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all, but that is the communication plan and it's really ramping up um, and it'll go throughout March. We do have to close the survey at the end of March so that we can compile all of the data and get it to you, um, which will take some time because hopefully we'll have a lot of participation. Great, thank you, Adrian. <clears throat> All right, any uh, thoughts or comments for Adrian? Martha? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. I actually um, took a quick minute to check out your live site just before this meeting there. So glad to see that it's up and alive. And so I checked uh, where you have the reference to the Massachusetts uh, uh, decarbonization roadmap. But it's mm -hmm. only the uh, original one from 2020. And so may I request to you and Stephanie too, that you add the link to the more modern 2022 reports, the clean energy goals for 2030, and then the one from December that has the clean energy goals out to 2050, because those have some sobering plots about what we have to do to get there from here. So yeah. could you add those? Yeah, we can add the link to the 2022 report. Yeah. Yeah, there's two of them. One that there's came out in June to, to 2030 and one that came out with the goals for 2050. That was just in December. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Janet. So in, in the um, ads thing, I also took a peek at the website and um, at the, um, I think it was, and I, I actually, when we were talking, when you were describing um, what our group is doing, I think we should add that um, we're also um, going to be prioritizing locations for solar development, including large scale ground night rooftop and parking lot canopies and doing a priority map for locations for large scale solar. Because um, I think nothing will get the the, um, the residents interest more knowing that, you know, this is coming out and I'm sure they're going to want to have input into that. So we're not just doing a bylaw, we're doing the priority map of locations for large scale solar, as well as prioritizing lo locations for solar development. And okay. that, might be, that might be the shortest way to say it, the second way I said it. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what we do wanna keep those, you know, 
we have a link to the web to your web page. So we do want to keep those short. But do um, we have do we have a but so anyway, I just I just think it, the, the priority map and the priority locations is going to be something of interest to people. Because that's I think that's what they're going to probably give most of their input on. All right. I'm happy to volunteer some of my neighbors' houses <laughs> as well as my own, but <laughs> and if you know. All right. Great, Adrian. Um, maybe some of us will see you at the public meetings and forums and so forth, um, which would be nice to meet in person. Um, but really appreciate um, the work that you've done for the town, uh, working with uh, Stephanie, um, Stephanie's leadership on this, <clears throat> um, and uh, look forward to the uh, um, ramping up with the public. Very exciting. Um, and then the results coming out uh, soon thereafter. Uh, so this has been really helpful. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, great. So let's um, move forward in, or maybe it's backwards in the agenda and start at the beginning. Um, and um, we have two sets of minutes to review and approve if we can. Uh, the first one has been lingering for a while. This was January 6th. If you recall, that was the meeting that the um, fire captain uh, was at and provided us some useful information on the um, on the um, uh, particularly with with regard to battery storage um, uh, and and safety issues. Uh, but have people let's go with that one first. Um, have people had a chance to uh, look at that in any comment or, or suggestions uh, or a motion to accept those minutes of uh, January 6th? Yeah, Martha. Can can somebody remind us of there was there was some particular question about those minutes that we had to check on? I think that got incorporated. Um, it was a reference to the ten feet. Oh, yes. Um, and so what had happened? Chris had asked a question, and uh, Chris Bascom had responded. So the way it, um, I think it was attributed to Chris only because of the way it was written. But what had happened was the person asking the question sort of it was just a topic that they were asking about with a dashed line and then Chris Bascom's response was after so I just clarified that it was Chris asking the question Chris Bascom responding and Chris did uh, Chris Bascom did respond about the 10 feet and what did he say it, whatever is in the minutes is what is captured so I had sent everybody out the draft minutes I can open it um let me just take a quick look. I mean, so is the answer still 10 feet or was it's it 10 feet? That's what he said. The the okay. the the guidance, right? He said the only measure, the only specified distance was um 10 feet. Hold on. Sorry, let me just get back. Uh, what if a forest should be 100 feet? Bascom responded, combustibles are allowed no closer than 10 feet. That that is that is the stated distance. So he confirmed that 10 feet is the mm -hmm. distance. Okay, thank you. It's up to you all. I think what his point was, was that you all could recommend, you know, something to be further. He was just saying that for their regulations, combustibles are 10 feet and nothing, everything has to be cleared within that 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, I will um, have a motion that the minutes be approved then. Thank you, Martha. I can second that. That was Laura. Thank you. Okay, great. And in no particular order by voice vote, Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay, minutes of January 6th are approved. Okay, and then also in our package were minutes from last meeting, um, February 28th, um, which I'm pulling up here. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions, suggested edits, concerns, or a motion to accept? 
or request that we put them on the screen. Chris. Yep. I thought there were minutes from February 17th. Am I wrong about that? Uh, what did I say? Uh, you said oh, the 28th. I apologize. That's, um, nope, hold on, sorry. Nope, they're the 17th. 17th that's right they do the same well, okay the okay sorry i i was looking at my file folder uh of a file with your date on it chris uh chris uh for the design standard sorry um yeah it was 217 sorry I I Janet. I move to accept the minutes of February seventeenth, twenty twenty three. Unless have people are people reading it right now or no? I can second that. Great, thank you, Laura. Yeah, are people? Uh, go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, and again, in no particular order, voice voice vote. Uh, Breger. Yes. Hanner. Yes. Brooks. Yes. Jemsek. Too many screens open. Um, yes. McGowan. Yes. Corcoran. Yes. And Pagliarulo. Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. Okay. Great. All right. Good. So we're caught up with uh, minute minute okay. approvals, uh, which is great. So let's move on. Um, uh, we'll do staff updates and then any committee updates. Um, so uh, Stephanie, anything? um at this point i think the all of the updates i would have given you were covered in the presentation so the big the biggest being the community events that are coming up so again just to reiterate the dates uh march monday march 13th will be the virtual meeting uh at seven o'clock and on saturday march 18th will be the first community event um in the woodbury room at the jones library from 12 to 2 and on Thursday, March 23rd, from 6 to 8 p.m. will be another same same exact setup for another opportunity for the public to engage in the Woodbury Room at the Jones Library. And that's from 6 to 8 on the 23rd of March. Great. Um, great, thank you. Um, yeah, Chris? So Stephanie, can you elaborate a little on the meeting on March 13th, because that wasn't one of the ones that Adrian mentioned. Um, it, it, and is that the same kind of meeting as the other two meetings, or is that different? She did actually mention it. It's the, oh, I'm sorry. it's the, it's okay. It's the virtual presentation of the assessment. So it's basically giving the information, pretty much the information that you got today, explaining how the methodology, um, and then also uh, giving an overview of the ways in which the public can get engaged to conduct the survey, to attend the events. Um, so it's kind of the informational session. Um, it'll be about an hour long, um, but all of the opportunities for response will be during the, you know, either online or at the two community sessions at the Woodbury Room. Great, any uh, any, any other staff updates, uh, Chris or, or Stephanie? I think we're good. Great. I don't have any. Nope. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, committee updates. Any committees uh, that, that are we're uh, liaising with? Um, I'll, I'll give a quick one from ECAC, uh, which actually uh, is really in, in uh, also in Stephanie's uh, st staff jurisdiction as well. But ECAC is planning to have a presence in a booth uh, and and some uh, uh, activities or information at the sustainability festival. Uh, that Stephanie coordinates uh, for the town uh, on the town commons, April 22nd. Uh, and so um, obviously something that um, we'd welcome people to uh, um, uh, visit us. Uh, and um, if there's any interest in sort of putting out any information about the working group, by, by law working group, um, I'm sure uh, we can accommodate that with, with ECAC um, as well. So uh, a bit, bit in the future, to deal with right away, but um, we're starting to plan for that. Um, 
anything else from any of the other committees we're affiliated with? Great. Um, okay, so let's move on to the core of the agenda, uh, which is um, uh, Chris to lead us through the work that um, she and her group does uh, uh, for us to draft and, and to sort of present the uh, bylaw in in the sections as as we're moving through. Um, and we've started this procedure uh, recognizing it again. It, we're going to read through everything again at the end when everything's sort of compiled together. Uh, but for now, we're trying to make cross progress section by section uh, by having a, a read through um, of the um, of the drafting that Stephanie, sorry, Chris is is uh, providing um, a, a sort of a first reading uh, where we're introduced to the language uh, of the new new drafting that Chris has done, and an opportunity to go back and do a second reading of that language the next week uh, to provide uh, Chris with some uh, any comments or edits um, after we've been able to um, digest the first reading. Um, so thanks, Chris. And um, uh, I know you you developed this this um, new section on on uh, design standards. Uh, this would be the first reading for that. Um, would like to, should we do that first, and then we'll go back and see if there was any comments or thoughts on sort of the second reading of the um, of the uh, submittal requirements section that we read through last week or two weeks ago. Um, I am sorry to say I haven't had a chance to go back and edit the submittal requirements okay. based on the um, comments that we received last week. I was kind of, um, how can I say this? Um, my tour over the last two weeks has been detoured by a zoning amendment that has loomed large. Um, yeah. And some of you will be familiar with that. But in any event, I apologize yeah. for that. But I do have this new section on design standards. Awesome. And um, this was taken mostly from the Cape Cod Commission, but also from um, Shootsbury's um, bylaw that oh, we great. recently adopted. Yep. So let's try to go through this yeah, and um, yep. we'll, we'll work on this. So um, it really lists, you know, items, different items that need to be addressed when um, reviewing um, a solar installation. So we'll start off and um, talk about each one. So the first one is access roads. Um, and access roads can be, you know, fairly disruptive, depending on what they're, uh, what kind of landscape they're going through. But anyway, so access roads shall be planned and constructed in consultation with the town engineer and the Department of Public Works, and shall be planned and constructed to minimize grading, stormwater runoff, removal of stone walls and trees, and to minimize impacts to natural and cultural resources. At the discretion of the Permit Granting Authority, that's what PGA stands for, roads should be curved to the extent possible to limit direct views into the project, especially from scenic roads. So are there any uh, comments on that section? No? Yeah. I can't. Do I, can I see people? I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was reading and not looking at hand. So, um, yeah, and, and feel free also, Chris, just to call on people as well. Okay. okay. Uh, Martha. Uh, yeah, this is a question that's triggered by this, but it's also more more general. I mean, thank you, Chris, for all this detail. But you know, what triggered me with the curved roads. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things put here and, and then in the screening and so on that are sort of nice to have, but how do they get prioritized compared to, say, the more important things of minimizing the grading and the removal of trees and, and so on? Uh, you know, curved roads, my picture is, oh my, you have to, you know, impact more land area if you want your road to curve. Uh, well, this is all at the discretion of the permit granting authority. So if there are reasons not to curve the road, to have it be straight, that have to do with um, 
the topography or cutting down of trees, that would certainly be taken into consideration. Um, these are really design standards, what it's going to look like. So there will also be standards related to um, operation and management and maintenance. And those will be dealing with things like um, erosion control and, th and that type of thing. I don't think we cover erosion control in this section. Um, so those are certainly very important things, but these are also things that need to be uh, taken into consideration. So I appreciate your comment, but that will come in an, in another section. Yes. Can I just jump in too, Chris, just to sort of state, and I'm sorry, I can't find my raising hand feature, so I apologize, um, that curved roads are important because if you have a straight road, uh, that's going to contribute to the potential for uh, uh, a more concentrated runoff, so you'll get yeah. greater velocity, and so the yeah. reason, you know, that's a really important reason to have those to help um, alleviate severe erosion. Yes, and so maybe saying uh, the, the, the curve rose to the extent possible isn't just then uh, for the purpose of the views, but also to help a limit erosion and, you know, whatever else. But I, I, okay, so I think it's just my general understanding that um, in the bylaw as a whole, there will be a separate section that has the overall priorities that will then guide the, the permit granting authority when they make their discretionary decisions on some of these details that are in this uh, section. Is that the true statement then? Yes, but um, I think that the permit granting authority um, makes its own priorities depending on the project. So. Um, we give them criteria uh, that they use to evaluate the project, and then they determine based on what's being presented to them, what the site is like, et cetera, um, what needs to be prioritized in certain instances. Um, so I think it'll become clearer as, as things go on. And you'll also, yeah, so I won't say any more about that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. And before you go on, uh, Stephanie, if you could just hit the magnifying up a couple notches would be really helpful to me, at least. Yeah. Down at the bottom right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so lighting. In general, most of these things aren't lit. Um, there's no reason to light them, but there might be reason to light them if there is need to um, maintain them or, or repair them. So lighting, lighting of solar vo photovoltaic installations shall be consistent with local, state, and federal law. Lighting of other parts of the installation, such as appurtenant structures, shall be limited to that required for safety and operational purposes and shall be reasonably shielded from abutting properties. Where feasible, lighting of the solar photovoltaic installation shall be directed downward and shall incorporate full cutoff fixtures to reduce light pollution. That's usually a requirement of both the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board. Um, and then the second paragraph, lighting of solar photovoltaic installations shall be limited to nighttime maintenance and inspections by authorized personnel. So in other words, there won't be lighting every night, just when there's a need to be there on the site to do something. All lighting shall comply with international dark sky standards, fixture of seal of approval, certification requirements. There should be no illumination when personnel are not on site. Okay, so if, are there things that people want to change or add there? Just real quickly for me, at least, Chris, is maybe to, um, I know this whole bylaw tends to deal more with large scale ground mounted solar PV installations. Uh, but just maybe to add add that at lighting for large scale ground mounted total PV installation, just so yeah. folks don't think they need to do this for their residential system. Right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, signage right. again. Uh, sorry, oh, uh, Janet. Sorry. So, Chris, I was a little confused by this section because it seems to um, kind of restate or um, what our current bylaw says about lighting because it's you know it has to be downcast dark spot dark, dark sky compliant you know not lit after business use which you know arguably it'd be hard to understand you know so i i wondered if it needed to be here or is it here just as a signal 
to people? There's actually nothing in the zoning bylaw that talks about lighting in this way. We never managed to get a lighting section of the bylaw together. There are standards that the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board relies on, and they make it a condition of their permit approval, but there is really not much written down. There is some, uh, there is a section that's kind of tacked on to the Zoning Board of Appeals um, rules and regulations that talks about lighting and talks about dark sky compliance. But um, I felt that this would be a good thing to include here since we don't have a separate section of our bylaw that deals with lighting and we don't have a specific um, lighting standard that is written down at this time, even though, okay. as I said, we we practice that, but we don't have it written. So that would be this would be encompassing over the solar things. And so the building commissioner and any board could use. It. OK, yep. Just real quick, quickly, also, Chris, um, unless it's in a different section, but is it would the lighting also be important for emergency um, personnel to have access to turn on at their discretion yes uh, so that would be maintenance inspections and emergency okay right okay oh. i will include that yes. sorry i must say as a as an astronomer i approve of having a <laughs> statement in here about uh reference to the dark sky uh, standards and uh, down directed lighting. So, you know, that is an overall concern. <laughs> Good. Um, again, signage is really not generally an issue on these um, in these installations, but it's worthy of, uh, of mentioning anyway. Um, so signs on large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations shall comply with Town of Amherst zoning bylaw <clears throat> article eight. Um, a sign consistent, consistent with Town of Amherst zoning bylaw Article 8 shall be required to identify the owner and provide a 24-hour emergency contact phone number of the installation owner or operator. Um, shall I just keep reading? Solar photovoltaic installations, and maybe we should change that wording to be consistent with the large scale. So I will do that. Um, shall not be used for displaying any advertising except for reasonable identification. We're having a celebration next door, so you'll probably hear clapping. <laughs> Someone is retiring. Uh, so anyway, these installations shall not be used for displaying any advertising except for reasonable identification of the manufacturer or operator of the solar, solar photovoltaic installation. Again, um, perhaps that should be, that term should be coordinated. Um, in addition to identification signs, the permit granting authority may permit signs for safety, such as no trespassing signs and signs requir required <clears throat> to warn of danger. So uh, maybe the may there should be shall, shall permit signs for safety. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, at the discretion of the permit granting authority, Exceptions may also be made for educational signs that provide information about the project. The permit granting authority shall determine the appropriate size, materials, and placement of such educational signs. To the extent possible, signs should be grouped together to reduce sign clutter. So oh. do people have comments about this section? Yeah, Laura has her hand up. I just had one comment. Um, so Chris, I think the only other thing to add would be signage for battery storage per the requirements of the fire department. Um, I know we talked about that when the fire department joined us. Yep. Making sure that, you know, they have instructions there. I think that should absolutely be a requirement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, utility connections. Can you scroll up that stuff? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> reasonable efforts as determined by the permit granting authority shall be made to place all utility connections from these installations, again, I'll coordinate that phrase, underground, depending on appropriate soil conditions, shape and topography of the site, and any requirements of the utility provider. 
Electrical transformers for utility con interconnections may be above ground if required by the utility provider. Any comments on that? Um, I guess I would, um, I'm not sure, was this from Cape Cod maybe or? or yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering, I, I, uh, and Laura may have some better um, sense on this, but that seems very unusual uh, that these projects certainly the wiring between the panels and so forth is generally underground or in conduits but from the inverter to the to the three-phase power from from my understanding of these solar projects are um, the vast majority are over overhead poles yeah okay. um, and i'm wondering cape cod may have some you know obviously some di different differences there I am concerned about um, the cost of that um, associated with that to, yeah. to, to a solar developer. Yeah. Um, I, agree with, I agree with that, Dwayne. Yeah. So this is also wording that is used by, generally speaking, by Shootsbury. So maybe there's a way of um, um, ameliorating this or mitigating it to allow some overhead wires and, and maybe Laura could help with the uh, wording of that, um, you know, where necessary, but generally speaking, if it's possible to put the uh, connections underground, it, are you able to come up with some language, Laura, that would make this acceptable? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of, um, we can certainly state there's a preference to have it underground, but I think making it re it a requirement is where um, you might you know, arrive at a place where the economics of a project would no longer make sense. So preference to have it underground where feasible. Yeah. yeah. And you could even say, yeah, where, I don't know if it's economically feasible as well, but yes. And the permit granting authority has to evaluate the economics. So I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to put that in. Yeah, but, maybe, um, I, I don't think so. feasible. I, yeah, I agree. Okay, glare. Solar panels to the maximum extent feasible shall be positioned and screened so as not to create glare and to minimize glare on surrounding occupied structures. The large scale ground mounted solar voltaic photovoltaic installation shall be positioned to minimize glare on any residence or public way. The applicant should submit ratings and technical spe specifications for the solar panels to ensure minimal reflectivity. The design of the installation shall prevent reflected solar radiation or glare from becoming a public nuisance or hazard to adjacent buildings, roadways, or properties. Design efforts may include, but not be limited to, deliberate placement or arrangement on the site, anti-reflective materials, solar glare modeling, and screening in addition to required landscaping. Any comments on this section? Dan, yep. Yeah, um, so this appears to me to be kind of very dependent upon adjoining land use. So what would happen, say, if they designed an array that didn't cause glare on any adjoining buildings and then someone built a building? Usually that's coming to the nuisance that's what that's called so when you come to the nuisance you don't really have the same rights as people who existed there previously okay so the the word the wording in this document could not be used to defend like the adjoining i guess to uh, how do i put it um uh to used against the solar operator essentially by adjoining property owners right i think you can always um file a lawsuit but i think that the chances of um winning the lawsuit and janet may be able to comment on this are less if you actually moved to a situation where there was a problem um so we try to prevent problems in general from affecting um houses or businesses but if you um, choose to locate next to a place that might have such a problem, usually you don't have that much um, 
you don't have that much to argue about. And and maybe we could ask yeah. Janet to you know elaborate on that. I don't I don't really know much about that area. So, but I do. It I think that probably happens a lot with farmland. Like people move next to farms and they basically say they smell. There's loud noises and things like mm -hmm. that. But I don't I don't have a, um, a legal background in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is all going to be reviewed by uh, the town attorney before it goes to mm -hmm. town council. So maybe that's a question that we could um, ask them. Sorry, I accidentally muted Dan and I think he was about to say something, so. No, it's Chris just answering my question, so. Okay, okay. all right, sorry about that, Dan. Okay, I'm just making a note. Okay. Um, okay, visual impact. Now, this is a section that I was a little bit uncomfortable with. Um, and so this is also a section that I would want to have KP Law look at. Um, and I don't know how much power a town has to address visual impact, but I put it in here because it seems like it seems like a worthwhile thing, but I'm not sure how um, how much teeth it's going to have. And again, maybe Laura could help with this. Maybe she's had experience with this, but let's read through it anyway. So, uh, and it's also something that we use um, for um, wireless telecommunication. We do have requirements um, for people who are coming to put in a wireless tele telecommunication pole with lots of antennae and things on top that they need to provide visual um, simulations and mm -hmm. convince the town that they're not um, marring the landscape. But let's read through it and see what we think. So a visual impact assessment shall be conducted that follows established protocols. Such assessment should include the following. Number one, a design narrative, a narrative that describes how the project has been configured or located and how it avoids or minimizes visual impacts. <clears throat> Maps and documentation of the analysis conducted shall accompany the narrative and be used to generally describe the anticipated visibility of the project. The narrative should provide details concerning alternative configurations or sites that were evaluated in the design process <clears throat> and the design mitigation strategies employed to reduce any visual impact to sensitive resources. Does anyone have any comments on that paragraph? Okay. Um, number two, inventory. An inventory and description of the cultural and scenic resources located within the viewshed of the proposed activity, including historic structures and historic districts, scenic roads, cultural landscapes, and vistas, um, in parentheses, open areas that are visible from public roads, close parens, and recreational areas. Information on these resources may be found by searching MACRIS, that's a database of historic uh, buildings, and by reviewing the town's master plan, open space and recreation plan, historic preservation plan, and other local plans. Any comments? It looks like Janet has a comment. Um, just go, I just let's go through the whole thing. I, I thought I undid my hand, but. Okay. Three, visualizations and simulations. With input from the permit granting authority, the applicant shall utilize tools such as photo simulations and or view shed analyses through renderings, line of sight studies, and or two or three dimensional visualizations i.e. photo montage, video montage, <clears throat> animation, anima animation produced through spatial information systems and geographic information systems to assess the visual impacts and describe the anticipated effect of the proposed project on the region's scen scenic and cultural resources. The number of simulations required will depend on the anticipated impact and the sensitivity of the resources present. Visual impact assessment should include consideration of all parts of the project, including all associated infrastructure. In the event more than one alternative is being considered, the visual impact of all alternatives should be evaluated by the applicant. The assessment should map locations along local public ways where the solar installation is visible above the visual horizon and anticipate locations <clears throat> such as high elevation points or across water bodies where distant views are possible. 
confer with, with Town of Amherst staff to identify points of view of particular interest or concern to be documented at the time of the visual impact assessment. Number four, visual mitigation. Propose mitigation measures as applicable. Mitigation may include careful sighting, sighting away from scenic resources and key view sheds, curvilinear access roads and screening. Okay. What comments do we have for that? Go ahead, Dan. Uh, this is really kind of about this entire section. Um, this seems very expensive. Um, and I'm concerned that having such a detailed analysis of visual impact could discourage solar development. And perhaps someone who has a little bit more experience like Laura could weigh in on, you know, what, how burdensome is this really to a solar developer? So again, I think, um, I think it's okay if we say it's a preference, but um, I mean, you're always going to do visualizations of the site and present that. Um, I think like, I'm, you know, I'm looking at like things like the number of simulations required will depend on the anticipated impact of the sensitivity of the resources present. Um, yeah. I mean, I think later on we go to address like landscaping, but um, yeah, I think it needs to be su suggestions. I mean, I think you can ask, you can ask as a preference for them to do certain things. Some of this stuff is, I just need to see like, uh, Chris, where did you get the language for three-dimensional visualizations, video, mon video montage? I mean, no one really ever does that. Well, um, people do it for um, architecture. Yeah, so, I've, never, I've, I've never seen yeah. it done for, for solar. I'm basically, not sure about yeah, solar, but I know they do it for architecture and it's fairly yeah. common, like Berkshire Design Group can whip these sure. things out and so can Kuhn Riddle. They don't seem to have much trouble presenting things like flyovers and yeah, you know, sure. showing I mean, a building from all different sides. And this it seems to be like a current way of presenting information but sure. this I, may be excessive yeah. so yeah it, it feels excessive i have never seen i've never seen that in solar i've never seen uh, i get for architecture but i've never seen it for solar essentially what's typically done is you know you'll do like a you know in, in advance of having like you'd have like an alta with like what the pan you know the orientation of the panels um i can look a little bit more deeply and see uh, you know what what is typically done that's you know above that um but i do think we're asking a lot here it could be that this is a requirement where the visual aspect of something is particularly important um and not in other parts of town so there's probably a lot of conversation that we can have about this section and maybe people can think about it and come back at the next meeting and and we'll talk about it a little more how's that that sounds good to me uh, but let's hear from uh, jack sorry um yeah my i kind of same uh question that laura had with regard to you, know, you mentioned the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, so where you were using the Cape Cod Commission and Town of Shrewsbury for the overall kind of template that, for this. So I was just uh, wondering where you got some of the nuts and bolts because you're kind of reaching over to, you know, wireless power and, you know, talking about architectural things. And it seems like this seems to be um, uh, kind of a reaching out to other uh sources and so yeah limiting it uh and discussing it you know next meeting sounds like a good idea um, 
Great, Janet. <clears throat> so looking at um, just, the, just the number three, um, I think it's not, it's pretty flexible because it, it's, it's sort of, um, it's pretty much what, you know, the planning board would do or the ZBA might ask someone for, you know, um, and I think Chris is right, is that the architects show us like, what does this building look like from 30 yards away or, you know, looking at it from Kendrick Park and things like that. So um, usually we get that. And if we don't get that, we ask for it because it, you know, it, like it does have impact depending on your point of view. So I think that it's something that the planning board of the ZBA could ask for anyway and get. It's just, it seems really spe specific, but it's also the language is very flexible. It's saying it could include this, like things like this. And so I think that, you know, I don't think the um, planning board would go mad with it or the ZBA. Um, so that's one thought is it's, um, but I also think, you know, this section on um, design standards or performance standards is a really key section, which is going to be things that we really care about you know, like with um, large scale solar installations. And I, I don't know if we have a question that would come out. Uh, I don't think we have a question in the survey, but I wonder if this issue about visual impact, if it's really important to the town people, this section is really important to have in. Um, we have a lot of scenic roads. We have a lot of natural beauty. We have the holy oaks and people climbing them and staring and hopefully going to eat at Atkins afterwards. So I think this is an important issue, but I, I sort of wish, I wonder if there's a way to, if it's really important to residents, then I think we leave it in and realize it's flexible. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of, those are, that's my thoughts. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Jack, are you, are you up again? No, okay. Uh, no, sorry. Yep, okay, great. Um, let, me, let me just put in my two cents and then we'll move on is, is uh, and we can I, definitely worthy section to talk about again next time. Um, and my, my thought is maybe to have sort of some minimum requirements, uh, which could be based on what the state of the art of solar industry is now in terms of what, what they're commonly uh, do with regard to photo simulation or, or visual uh, vi visualization, uh, but then sort of at the discretion of the PGA, Sorry, what was that again? PGA. PGA, yeah. PGA, um, having uh, you know, you know, depending on the sensitivity of the of the view shed and so forth, um, uh, and the the um, uh, um, who who would be affected, um, then to have the ability to require some additional um, higher quality and and uh, um, informative visualizations. <clears throat> but we can all discuss that next time. Uh, but Dan? Yeah, um, I, I think um, having strict requirements regarding aesthetic aspects of these projects, um, to me personally, snap, smacks of nimbyism. Um, you, know, it, you know, if you want clean energy, you know, you have to tolerate the infrastructure for it. So I, I think what Janet was talking about is a really good idea. But you need to know where the people of Amherst stand on this, as opposed to what my opinion is, right? Um, and I think that would really inform how we write this section. Great, thanks. And I guess this is this section, this this specific section three is not uh restricting it's just um what's required um by the applicant uh to provide to the town for um uh to, to be able to help to review the project um it's it, it comes a little bit later i think uh chris in terms of what the remedies are to mit mitigate visual impact yeah and sometimes these these don't have to be, um, you know, fly throughs, video fly throughs. They can be as simple as um, giving a cross section of topography over a certain distance and showing 
view lines. You know, these are things that I did in graduate school when I was studying landscape architecture. They're not that hard to do just to show like if you have a scenic road and you have a solar array on a hill, well, how much of that solar array you're going to see from this scenic road and are there things that you can do with, you know, planting in front of it that can screen it from the road. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a fly through. It could be as simple as a cross section. Okay. Okay. So the next section is fencing. Um, so I think fencing is important to the people who mm -hmm. build these things, but in any event, um, appropriate measures shall be taken to prevent the solar arrays from being damaged or tampered with by individuals trying to access the area of the installation. So that's like acknowledging that the installer and the operator has a, a stake in keeping these things safe. The method of securing the site shall be subject to the approval of the permit granting authority. The need for fencing shall be determined by the applicant unless such fencing is needed to comply with town bylaws and or as required per national electric code. I think maybe the state has some requirements too, but I'm not sure. And Laura might know about this. If installed, such fencing shall be no more than eight feet tall. The ones that we've seen here have been um, seven feet tall. The Cape Cod Commission had up to 10 feet tall, but I thought eight feet would be reasonable for Amherst, but that's certainly something we can talk about and shall be placed at least six inches off the ground to allow migration of wildlife and shall have an emergency access system, padlock or box at each gate. Um, again, the six inches off the ground is up to conversation because I know in at least one instance in Amherst, we've had nine inches off the ground and Stephanie may remember which one this is. I think it was the um, Pulpit Hill Solar that had a requirement for nine inches off the ground. But um, so that's something we could say six to nine inches, whatever. Uh, the fence shall be consistent with the character of surrounding properties set back from roadway frontage and public areas and screened by vegetation. So do people have comments about this section? Laura has her hand up. Oh, yep, sorry. Yeah. So I guess my only comment is I have not yet seen, um, so when developers build a project, and they sell it to an asset owner. I have never encountered a situation where you have like a larger ground mount system and a fence is not required because they want to protect their asset from, you know, random people. I mean, you can't just go approach a solar farm. There is like electrical equipment that could be dangerous. And they also want to prevent damage to the farm itself. What I don't know is I know, you know, they may have their own fencing requirements, but um, I think this is just really standard. I think they would want that. Mm -hmm. okay. So you don't see any problems with this? No, I don't. The only thing I question is whether we're, you know, the dictation of the height, um, you know, we might have to be flexible on that. I mean, some, some asset owners might want it at 10 feet. I'm not sure. Maybe they, maybe we could say no more than eight feet tall unless um, permitted by permit granting authority. And that gives the applicant an op opportunity to talk to the yeah. permit granting authority and um, tell them reasons why they need yeah. something that's taller than that. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Um, screening. The large scale ground mounted photo solar photovoltaic installation shall be designed to minimize its visibility, including preserving natural vegetation to the maximum extent possible blending in equipment with the surroundings, adding vegetative buffers and or fencing to provide an effective visual barrier from adjacent roads and driveways and from abutting dwellings. The installation shall be effectively screened year round from all public and private ways and from adjacent residential lots. The permit granting authority may alter or waive this requirement if such screening would have a detrimental impact on the operation and performance of the array. Where existing vegetation in the setbacks is insufficient to achieve year-round screening, additional screening shall be provided, including but not limited to planting of dense vegetative screening, fencing, berms, use of natural ground elevations and or land contouring, all depending on site-specific conditions. 
tree cutting within the required setback area shall not be permitted if it would reduce to any degree the effectiveness of the year round screening. If additional plantings are required for screening, a planting plan shall be submitted showing the types, sizes, and locations of material to be used. Using a diversity of plant species native to New England and shall be subject to the approval of the permit granting authority. Plantings shall include a variety of native trees and shrubs of varying heights staggered to effectively screen the installation from view during construction and operations. The depth of the vegetative screen shall be a minimum of 50 feet, unless otherwise approved by the PGA. At least 75% of the planting shall consist of evergreens and shall be evenly spaced throughout the setback area. I think uh, Shootsbury used 30 feet, but Cape Cod or one other group said 50 feet. So that's also a number that's open to debate. Additional plantings should include native plants that provide food, pollen, and or shelter for native wildlife and or follow a food for forest model, which I don't really know what that is, but um, that was something that was in the Cape Cod bylaw. Integrating trees, shrubs, perennial plants, and ground covers to mimic a native woodland that creates habitat for local wildlife and provides food for humans and wildlife. Use of invasive plants as identified in the most recent version of the Massachusetts prohibited plant list maintained by the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources is prohibited. Cultivars of native plants may be acceptable if sourcing of native species is not possible. That's the end of that section. Oh no, there's yeah, a, yeah. no, there's a couple more things. Yeah. <laughs> um, planting of the vegetative screening shall be completed prior to connection of the installation. Plants shall be maintained and replaced if unhealthy by the owner operator of the installation for the life of the installation. Large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations shall not be approved unless the system design provides screening and buffers to adequately protect scenic vistas and view sheds from residential uses. Uh, that doesn't really make sense. Public streets and any waterways or water bodies. There's something odd about the wording of this, which I noticed when I was writing it, but I'm not sure how to fix it. To adequately protect scenic vistas and view sheds, comma, and to adequately protect residential uses, public streets, probably something like that. Okay, any, any comments on this section? I do, Dwayne, you're on mute. Laura had her yeah, hand up sorry, first. Laura. Yeah, sorry, Laura. So a couple things. So um, Chris, if you scroll up top, a little bit higher up. Okay, right there. Where did it go? Tree cutting within the required setback area shall not be permitted if it would reduce to any degree the effectiveness of your own screening. My only concern there is that one of the requirements, obviously, of building a large scale solar facility is that you need to ensure that there's no shading um, on the farm itself. So if there are trees in the setback area that cast shade on the on the PV panels, um, we you know we couldn't say that. Uh, and then my other comment is, um, go further down a little bit to the last part. Okay. So, and I I tend to agree with with Dan. This last section here. But they shall not be improved unless it provides screening and buffers to adequately protect scenic vistas. I think it's completely fine to require landscaping requirements, shrubs, things like that. But um, I also want to be careful because I, I don't, I, 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 based on our attorney's review of sort of the land law in the US, I don't, or excuse me, Massachusetts, I don't believe we can reject a solar PV installation um, because we don't like how it looks or because we can see it from a certain point. Um, so, you know, I've never seen a developer say no to any, you know, plantings and things like that. Um, so I think we can do that, but I, I would say, I don't know, I, I would, I would um, not have that language be as strong. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. Okay. And then the I other piece, I, yeah, the other piece I would add to that would be not just putting in, and I don't think this is, I don't necessarily know it's right here, but I think any system that we do, that the town does approve, it's not I just can't hear you. Oh, really? 
Okay, I'll get closer. Um, when we do require vegetation, um, we need to require that uh, they maintain the vegetation. As in, you can't just plant trees and not walk, you know, in the middle of July and say, yeah, I planted trees and walk away. You know, there has to be some sort of management of the vegetation as well. So, yeah, I think it says uh, in the paragraph above where, well, let's see, uh, planting of vegetative screening shall be completed prior to connection, and then plants shall be maintained and replaced if unhealthy by the owner for the life of the installation. So, does that that's capture? Good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, okay. Laura. Yep, Janet. Um, just in terms of um Laura's concerned about um, I think the third, the second to last paragraph about um shall not be approved. I think there's mitigation or flexibility in the word adequately. It's not saying there can't be any view of the solar array from the view shed, but it has to be adequately protecting it. So there's some flexibility there and some sort of softening. So that's just one point. I'm not sure if it will satisfy um, her concern, but I think that's kind of soft language that gives um, discretion. I just, I had a, um, this, you know, this is also like, is this important to people? I, I think the more you screen, the more support you have for solar. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I, I feel this way about design standards for buildings. It's like, it could be big and ugly or it could be big and beautiful and people will support big when it's pretty more than when it's just ugly. Um, so I think this might be an important section and an important concern for people in town. But a very tiny point I wanted to make on that one is I wondered if you would want to require the removal of um, invasive plants. I think we, I, I think the planning board once required somebody to remove some plants in a parking lot. And I just wondered, if that's part of the maintenance of it or not. I just it just kind of, I just remembered that. That would be a big, um, a big ask, I think, if, especially if this thing were really large. The hope is that when you plant something below the solar panels that you um, nurture it enough so it grows well and doesn't allow invasive species to come in, but then to ask, um, the operator to come and actually remove yeah. invasive species from a large area. I don't know if that's a reasonable uh, requirement. That's a, that's a good point. Great. I had one one <clears throat> comment, Chris. Um, so it, it it this this section has to do with screening. Uh, so it's it's the peripheral area around the array and screening it from visualization, particularly that was in the previous section. Um, I am also, and I, I think it may go in this design uh, category, or maybe it fits somewhere else, but um, within the array, um, you know, what, ha what, what the ground, uh, what, what's the habitat uh, encouraged and the uh, planting uh, that's encouraged uh, in the, within the array, I think is also something we might address. Um, and I'm thinking here, you know, because some developers might put gravel, mm -hmm. some developers might put grass, mm -hmm. um, and um, um, and I think we want to. I'm not sure about prohibit those things, but certainly encourage um, and maybe give preferential treatment to uh, developers on these larger arrays to plant um, native species and particularly pollinator friendly species. In, and, and species that are supportive of, of wildlife. We're gonna raise the fences up a bit so uh, wildlife can use these areas as well. Uh, but there may be a, a section, maybe it's not in screening, but it's another section that talks about the um, ground, treatment mm -hmm. of ground uh, within the array. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and, and to that point, uh, which I was scratching my head a little bit on the very first uh, par a paragraph in the screening section um, where it says uh, shall be um, uh, the installation shall be designed to minimize its visibility including preserving natural vegetation and so forth that 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 it's probably um, also focused and and uh, applicable to the screening area mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but we might make that clear and then have a separate section that would be on the um, internal area yep. that's probably a better term for that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Got it. 
All right, this is super, Chris. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more sentence here. Um, control of vegetation, synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers may not be used to control vegetation or animals except as otherwise approved by the permit granting authority. So um, some uh, bylaws have, uh, you know, blanket um, prohibition on the use of synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. I know that in the Hickory Ridge installation, there was a need to use herbicides. Um, and it had to do with, I think it had to do with clearing the site for the solar array. And, and maybe Stephanie knows more about this than I do, but there was a need to, for the um, applicant to go back to the Zoning Board of Appeals to ask permission to use um, herbicides to clear the ground. And I think it had to do with the ability to plant what was actually wanted there. So they wanted to wipe out what was there that was bad and then plant something better. And so we want to make sure that um, there's that ability to do that. We don't want to say you can't use herbicides at all. Um, and maybe there's some language that should be put here having to do with uh, watershed protection. I know when I read through the Water Supply Protection Committee report, there was concern about using synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers near water supplies. So maybe there's some added language that needs to go in about that. I'll, I'll just add on to that, um, that in our, in, uh, our clean energy extension, our pollinator friendly uh, certification for PV, um, pollinator friendly PV certification. Um, we talk, we talk about the use of herbicide there too. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's similarly, it's, um, you're able to use it, but under very strict and, and, uh, necessary circumstances. So there's not a categorical exclusion, but there's also recognition that there are some cases where you just can't, um, otherwise, um, get this, uh, habitat established without first applying some herbicide um, from from my understanding. Could you send me a reference to that? Sure. Yeah. 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 All right. OK, uh, Laura. OK, sorry. my question to you, uh, Chris, was is this language? Um, I just want to make sure that we prohibit this, you know, synthetic pesticides, et cetera, with all forms of development and Amherst and not just solar? Um, this is language that I got from the Water Supply Protection Committee. And I think I also got it from Cape Cod. Um, so we do not prohibit um, use of these materials in all cases of development in Amherst. I think they are possibly prohibited in areas that um, are adjacent to wetlands. So within 100 feet of wetlands or water supply, um, but we don't prohibit it everywhere in Amherst. Yeah, so I guess one other follow-up point there, because certainly in sensitive watershed areas, we absolutely want to do this. But just two points, it makes complete sense why Cape Cod would do this, because they're Cape Cod and they're basically at sea level. Um, but I also want to note that while we're utilizing the Cape Cod bylaw, um, Cape Cod is notoriously one of the most cost prohibitive and difficult places to put solar in the state. You do not have a lot of solar in Cape Cod. So I just want us to sort of take all the language with a grain of salt. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and I guess my, my comment there is, um, I, I don't necessarily, I think we should treat solar just like we treat other types of development. Um, okay. And uh, if we don't require it for other types of development, I think we can give a strong preference but um, that's that's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, um, Jack. Yeah, um, yeah. I just think that there we are, you know, generally as a as a society, kind of moving away from you know the herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers in general, um, and that you know there's a way around that I, in terms. I think uh, you know planting appropriate vegetation. You know, to begin with, and then, but we're, you know, um, I, I, I just think it's fairly standard in terms of best management practices of the other bylaws that 
that we uh, have at our uh, disposal to review. Great, um, Martha. Uh, yeah, just in, in response to that that point about do we prohibit uh, synthetic pesticides, et cetera, in other cases, uh, I think we're, as Jack says, we're moving in that direction and maybe we should, or maybe in a few years we will be prohibiting uh, the use of these pesticides and other forms of development too. So I think it is, doesn't harm us to put that in here right now. I know in our neighborhood, um, somebody hired a herd of goats to take out all the poison ivy and apparently it worked pretty well and they didn't have to use pesticides so you know there are alternatives all right good um Laura, did you have your hand up yeah, again i'm yeah, sorry just, just one oh, more yeah, quick yeah, please. Um, i would say that i i wasn't aware of that i agree with jack and, and martha so i think that's good to include um i but i also would go you know I think one of the things that I would suggest including would be, and I don't know if it's here or not, but that we would give preference to solar farms that incorporate agrivoltaics. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's sort of the next wave here is that I'm working with another number of, you know, developers now who are incorporating like, you know, actual bee farming on the site or growing vegetation, like actual farm plants around the solar arrays. So. If that's, you know, I don't know if it's here, Chris, or somewhere else, um, I do think that that's very much in the spirit of sort of our goals of a community. Great, yeah, and I'm not sure where that, where we might, where that uh, issue of, of preference, at least on farm agricultural land to have preference for uh, dual use um, array configurations. Um, I'm not sure where that where that would go in the structure of the bylaw, but I, I agree that's something we we might want to look at. Um, sorry, Jack, is your hand up again? Be great. Yeah, but yeah, fertilizers, uh, you know, different ball game uh, in general versus herbicides, pesticides. But it seems like this section needs a little bit of work. But I mean, I, just looking at the other bylaws, it, it's. Uh, we're probably paying more attention to this and and it's all good <laughs> but we'll have chris let chris have some fun with this one so. all right super all right good uh make sure you put your hand down when you're when you when you're done uh, and don't have another comment uh which is helpful but um so i know i know uh janet so um, this actually ties into what I wanted to talk about later. And it seems like this section of design and performance standards we need to leave open. Because if we, as a committee, make a recommendation that when, you know, that large scale arrays are okay on, you know, on, um, you know, prime soils or soils of statewide importance, but we're going to require um, dual use farming and what kind. So that, that could be a performance standard saying a plan for dual use farming that for a veg, a vegetables or, you know, a herd of animals and things like that. Um, so, and, the, and similar for, for, for forestry, if the, if we're allowing, you know, trees to be cut, you know, is there some kind of, um, you know, wildlife corridors to be set up or some, you know, plantings and things like that. So I think this section, I think we just leave open, Mm -hmm. or kind of later discussions. But I do have a question in that same idea, Chris. When I looked at the outline, there's going to be, there were also sections for storm preparedness, land clearing, erosion control, noise control, and mitigation. I'm not, is that coming later or, okay, I, did, I know you, I know your time pressure is more than maybe most since I spend a lot of time in meetings with you. <laughs> um, and it seems almost weekly now, so, um, or bi-weekly. So, I think that this design and performance standards, we may be filling in with different things that we want to control or, you know, require. And that, of course, would go back to, um, you know, the application requirements. If we're requiring dual use, then the applicant has to obviously put together a plan for that. And so anyway, I just there's more to come, I think, you know, but we're, we're, we're sallying on. <laughs> Great. OK. Um... This is great, um, and I think starting to get into some of the conversations 
we've all been waiting for in terms of uh, 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 making this bylaw really uh, appropriate for Amherst and, uh, um, and, and address some of the uh, important issues that we um, all recognize are uh, in front of us and now coming to fruition. Um, anything to wrap up, Chris, or is this, uh, we're, we're at the end, right, of the draft? Yeah, we're at the end and I'll go back and, and um, uh, edit this um, based on our conversation today and also edit the, the one that we went over previously, the submittal requirements based on comments that I received and hopefully have those you next time and maybe i'll have more uh an, another new one we'll see okay okay but this is great and really appreciate your ability to um draft this for us and and uh, walk us through it um so great um okay um we're, we're uh um as usual um running out of time what i propose uh looking at the um agenda here is that we take five minutes uh, Janet, for you to introduce um, your topic to us in terms of future topics, um, allow for others to um, bring forward some additional topics, um, and then uh, and then we go to public comment. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if everybody had a chance to read through my memo, but um, you know I've been looking at the natural working land sections of the 2025 to 2030 climate action plan, and then also at the um, the Amherst Climate Plan and Resilience Plan that ECAC put together. And I'm not sure if the town council endorsed, but I think they did. And so when I read those plans, you know, which talk about increased community access to farmland, more local local food production, you know, protecting all these lands that sequest the farm lands and forests and wetlands that are sequestering carbon, you know, and increasing protection, you know, my reaction is okay, we need to protect that. And so the question to me isn't solar versus farmland, solar versus forest, but how do we do all three? How do we get in, get solar? How do we get keep our farmland? And how do we protect our forests? And so how do we, you know, we can, you know, so that's my question and my issue. And so I think to get to that question, like, do we want to allow solar on prime soils and soils of great, you know, statewide importance? Do we want to allow, you know, a, a large scale array on a forest area? We need to talk and look at what, the importance of those are or how you can do it in a way that doesn't compromise the values that we want to keep. And so I have been talking to some people who are involved in, you know, regional and statewide agriculture um, who have been looking at this issue. I've been, you know, I've been looking at maps of Amherst land and the Pioneer Valley. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I grew up in an area which had tons of farming um, on Long Island for, you know, feeding basically New York, and now we just provide, you know, that's been all covered up except for some vineyards and things like that. And so I do have this personal sense of urgency of like not losing a resource that's kind of amazing. And we, we sort of take it for granted. Um, so I, I was, my proposal is basically to have us look at farm, farm soils, farmland, what the current thinking is, um, how can we do both on the same piece of land or can we, or some lands do we want to set aside? Um, and then also the same for forests. And I have some ideas for speakers. And I would love to work with someone about that to kind of put together maybe a session on each and then talk about like how we can do everything, how we how we can really have it all, if that's possible. Uh, I think that's it. I mean, you know, in terms of the forest land, we might be limiting the size of arrays. We might be making sure they're not in a wildlife corridor. We might be, um, you know, saying no, we might be, you know, requiring some kind of offsets or mitigation. And so it'd be good to look at what, what people are doing on that, as well as, you know, what the state is thinking, because I think the state is going to come out with some guidance, too. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how fast I spoke. I tried. No, that, that's a good summary of, of your uh, <laughs> thoughts and concerns and, and memo um, uh, and, and um, proposal, I guess. Um, let's hear from from Okay. Martha had her hand up first. Okay, Martha, then yep. Laura, and then Jack. Yes. Oh, sorry, okay. I missed you, Chris, too, but it's okay. All right. Re regarding the farmlands, I had some uh, conversations with Dave Zomack, and he has offered to come and speak to our group about the farmlands in Amherst, and I would highly recommend that. I think it would help if we had just some general things like 
How much is the acreage of farmland? How many different kinds of farms? What kinds are they? Do we have mainly vegetable farms or orchards or hay fields and cattle? Uh, because And then we would be able to get some assessment of what might be appropriate for dual use. Uh, maybe he can tell us something about the soil analysis. I know Deerfield, there was news in the paper that they'd done their soil analysis, so on, so that we could do things that would be relevant to the farmers here in Amherst to in, encourage solar with the needs of of the specific farms in mind and what might work for dual use or what we might want to uh, say that would be helpful or, or what requirements to put in. So I would like to request that we take Dave Zomack up on his offer. He's the conservation director for Amherst and invite him to come and give a presentation with an overview of uh, our local farmlands and the ability to ask him questions. Great. Thank you, Martha. And we did we did follow up with Dave Zomack and he's on board to do that. Oh good. Uh, so he did he did follow up, yeah talk yeah. with you. Okay. Um, yeah. That, that, that being said, I would suggest, I mean Dave Zomack is the con uh what's his full title conservation director. Mm -hmm. Um he's also the assistant town manager. I was just going to say if we get some specific things that we want him to present exactly um ahead of time so that he can you know, really utilize his time well. Yeah, yeah, I think I think beyond. I mean, he can speak to a lot of, of the issues beyond farms too, in terms of yeah. Uh, yeah. conservation yeah. land more generally as well. Uh, and to your point, not just of what the farms are, but what's already conserved uh, in in uh, in the town with regard to farmland, forest lands, and open space and so forth. Um, so um, I don't know. I'll work with Stephanie in terms of scheduling that as soon as maybe next meeting or the following meeting depending on Dave's Dave's availability. Okay, good. Yes, well, I will. But, uh, but uh, to, to Stephanie's point, I think we'd be best off having a um, uh, sort of a, a, a set of of uh, subjects we want Dave to cover for us. Yes, well, I, I'll send Dwayne and, and Stephanie, I'll send you my uh, little list of questions then. Yeah, well, we certainly had your email yes. um, on that. Okay, yes. um, Laura, we'll, yeah. Um, so just one comment. I think, you know, uh, philosophically, I agree with, you know, the desire to preserve um, rich ag agricultural farmlands. But I can tell you that I've seen this play out a lot of times across the country, where when you have farmers who are not able to make a living with whatever product they're farming, they move to solar. And I don't think it's our place to, um, and we're just setting ourselves up for a big legal battle, to tell a farmer of prime agricultural land that you can't do something unless we have an alternative solution that provides the same economic return. Um, so I would just say we should tread carefully there because I speak to um, so many farmers across the country who, you know, they do solar on part of their ag land so they can make ends meet. You know, the price of soybeans, corn, whatever it might be, have plummeted, or they're aging farmers, and you know um, they're considering doing solar or selling it to a residential developer. So I, I think we need to just be mindful about how we how we proceed. I think having Dave here is, is a great idea, um, but I just want to make sure we're also realistic in what we're putting down. Great, thanks, um, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, my, I guess uh, along the same vein of Laura, but also more importantly, I think that uh, solar is more like borrowing the land versus a more permanent type of development that, you know, we would see residential or, you know, commercial industrial development. And it, and it kind of gives me a little bit of relief knowing that, you know, in 30 years with, you know, the economic, you know, climate changing or our you know, knowledge of climate uh, sustainability needs that it becomes more viable uh, at that point. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do would a little bit concerned about us telling landowners that they have good soil that they need to farm it. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, and, and, I, and again, I, I've said this before, I think Amherst is, uh, you know, fairly adequately uh, uh, protective of 
of the you know with regard to conservation areas and designation of of uh, existing farmlands and, and areas uh, through various programs. Right, and I think um, um, Dave Zomack could uh, illuminate that for us um, as as a group. So, thank you. Okay, let's um, finish up with Janet, and then I want to um, open it up for any public uh, comments. So I appreciate what people Thanks, are. Laura. So uh, that's actually why I think we need to do uh, some sessions on this because when I was talking to the statewide people, they were talking about like farmers need money, and at the same time, a lot of farmers are looking for land it's expensive and the solar kind of conversions make the land more valuable. And so, and they kept on saying, not just sheep, you know, <laughs> you know? and um, you know, some lands really need to be. So I think that nuanced look is something that farmers and people in the, in the industry can give us. I would like to see us maybe to, as homework, read um, ECAC's, the climate action plan sections on farmland and also the state plan, the 2020, 2030 about natural and working lands. And, both of these plans are really long, so I could send out the page numbers because it, it gives you a different background and it's kind of complicated and so it and it's nuanced. So I, I thought that would be a good background or homework if I can assign that. But um, I could also talk to the people I've talked to about you know coming to speak at a meeting too. Um, and also maybe Jonathan Thompson from the Harvard Forest who's been working on this issue for forests. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, very good. Really uh, good conversation. Um, Stephanie, if you can invite any public comment, um, and we'll take a, we'll go over time a little bit. If people can drop off, obviously. Sure. Uh, Jenny has her hand up. So Jenny Kalick, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, everybody. Exciting day with a live website. Very quickly, uh, the website links to sustaining Amherst. Uh, the web page in the town. I had a look over there, uh, and I know everybody's busy in town. First noticed it was stale, but then when I actually clicked on some of the links, there's one that goes to a casino website. There's one that goes to a Russian shopping oh my. website. Uh, so maybe, you know, whatever y'all decide, you could remove that link. Yeah, Jenny, for... you can talk to me about that offline. <laughs> so tell okay, and let me know, yeah. which rather than taking the time for this meeting, we can talk okay, about that. I just don't thank think you for the heads up. It's already live. And my, actually, my computer said some of those sites are dangerous. So I think the sooner you could get it off yeah, well, and then just think about fixing it, that would be great. Uh, and the other suggestion was uh, with the solar assessment, I didn't hear anything about uh, environmental justice overlay. And that's an important overlay that the state has done. It could be useful for people to be able to look at that overlay when they look at the assessment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. And is there anyone else from the attendee list who would like to speak or ask a question? Not seeing anybody else. All right, great. Um, okay, so we can close out the minute, uh, the meeting, um, and uh, it just we're on schedule to meet again in two weeks on March seventeenth, again at eleven thirty, um, and uh, look forward to continuing going through the bylaw. Um, and Stephanie, I guess you'll work with Dave Zomack in terms of what meets his calendar, um, maybe yep. the, that 17th or the following meeting would be great. We'll try to get him for the next meeting. Great. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Pause.